All right, here we go. Are we ready? Yeah. For another fun one. Welcome to Music City, Nashville, Tennessee. This is Day Drinking Nashville with Kimber and, and Amy. Hey guys, uh, welcome again to our show. And today we've got a really special treat for you that was a little bit unexpected. So uh, just like we always talk about, you never know who's going to show up at Wine Down Nashville. Well, it happened again. We've got Rich Start here from the Monkees. And not only the Monkees, but like, hey, hey, we're the Monkees. Oh, yes. <laughs> thank you for doing this. We're super excited to have you here. I mean, this oh, is thanks. so exciting. I'm super excited. My pleasure. Yay. <laughs> So um, we've got a, a plot twist because Rich does not drink alcohol. <laughs> no, but we might drive him to drink. But we just figured the more, more, uh, more for us. So yes. you're going to still go on with our show. What are you having to drink here, Rich? Do you um, know? It's something with ginger. Yes. And a lime on the top, and it's fizzy. <laughs> And it's busy. Yes. So what is he drinking? Because actually, it's a mocktail, and you can try this at home. Yes, absolutely. And plus, it's got a little seed lip in there, I think, too, right? Seed lip. Right. Seed lip. Spice. Yes, spice. Ooh. Yes. So a little ginger root. So yes, absolutely. So seed be. lip is like an aromatic, and it does not contain alcohol, but right. it is really nice to flavor non-alcohol and alcoholic drinks. Oh, that's good. That's tasty. Isn't that tasty? It's got a little fizz to it in the back. Got a little fizz. We Ooh. like it. We like it. So um, Kimber and I do like alcohol and in quantity. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so Kimber, tell us what we're going to be featuring today on Day Drinking. Da -da -da -da. So today we're actually going to be showing Morgan Wines, which these are fantastic. I love these wines. I'm so excited to have these here. Um, we're going to have their unoaked Chardonnay, which a lot of people don't like Chardonnay because they don't like that oaky quality in a Chardonnay. Right. And this is a unoaked, so you don't have to worry about that. And then we also have a Coach de Crow, which you are going to absolutely love. Yes, she is my style. I know so your I'm style. Sure so let's start <clears throat> off with uh, a little unoaked Chardonnay. I'm going to pour a little bit for our fabulous cameraman over there yeah. behind the camera. Yeah. The production crew of one. Absolutely. John Billings. <laughs> Who gets to drink? Cheers, crew, everyone. Yes. Cheers, everyone. Yes. Cheers. 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 Yay. All right. So if you guys come to Wine Now Nashville and go, I would like a very buttery Chardonnay, I will say, can't have this one. <laughs> no, absolutely. This one is unoaked. Um, this one is actually uh, co-fermentations -ferm uh, mm. on it. It is nice. um, got a little bit of a green apple mm. nose on it you know what it's got some body to it as well it's not it's not super light yes i'm doing the same thing with my drink <laughs> i feel left out so i want to i want to take the bouquet in this is very crisp i'm sure your drink is too yeah we have some ginger root yeah it's a little crisp yeah this is actually it's got the it's nice it's crisp it, it it's, is that's very pretty very pretty that's um, got a, a nice finish to it it's very little smooth. citrus on it yeah that's that's gorgeous yeah. gorgeous gorgeous all right hook, hook a girl up i will okay absolutely here's my glass she's more please poor more please <laughs> Oh my God! That's what we do here. So, it's called day drinking for a reason. It's called day drinking for a reason. So we want to pour this glass of wine and enjoy ourselves because we want to um, put Rich Dart on the spot. <laughs> here he is. <laughs> here I am. Here I am. So uh, what do you want to know? What don't we want to know? Yeah, seriously. Oh. So I don't know. <laughs> well, tell us about your music career. That's what I was say. I want to. Yeah, where are you from? Like, I don't oh. know where you're from. Your He's music from career. How'd you guys? <laughs> yeah. staying you, at your house. Just brought him over. <laughs> how you? Um, how you got into the music industry? Those kind of things. Those are things I want to know. So, where'd you grow up? I grew up in a little town called Clinton, Connecticut. Okay. Yes. Which is right on Long Island Sound. Mm -hmm. If you look at Connecticut, not the little hanging part, but like this, the rectangle. It's just left of center. No, just right. Wait, left, right. Yeah, it's just right <laughs> of center. Okay. Um, and uh, I grew up there. I was really big in, into uh, local music there. A lot of a lot of people have come from that area, Connecticut. Actually, there's a lot of Broadway performers that have come from there. Um, a really amazing guitar player named Jeff Pivar, who's played with uh, Ray Charles and. Um, Crosby, David Crosby, mm -hmm. he had a, a band with David Crosby. Uh, and then like P. 
people in Hollywood have come from there. And then there's me. So, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, and um, went to college for music, mm -hmm. graduated, uh, came back to Connecticut, and just started getting involved with as much as I could in the local music scene. So you went to college for music, but you didn't just do it to teach? <laughs> No, well, see, breaking that's the, the mold, thing. The that's the thing. I wanted to go to school for music performance, but my parents, being good parents, mm -hmm. I'm not knocking them, because now that I'm a parent, I totally get it. Um, they, they wanted me to have the fall back on mm. thing. Mm -hmm. So they sent me to school to be a music teacher. That was the thing, because they were, they were paying the majority of my education. Gotcha. So uh, I went to a little tiny school called Keene State College in New Hampshire because it's a really good teaching school. Uh, but I skipped all my education classes to practice. Mm -hmm. oh, so I ended up changing my major to performance, graduated with a performance degree, uh, came back to Connecticut and just started hustling. Uh, I actually started out uh, in the classical scene because I was working in a print shop mm -hmm. and the uh, music director for one of the symphonies in Connecticut came in to get the program printed for their concert and I said, uh, hey, you know, I'm a percussionist. I just graduated with a degree. I do all percussion. And he, he gave me the number of the contractor and then I started in the classical world. And then from there I went to like all the shows that get put on in Connecticut because a lot of shows that go to New York for Broadway mm -hmm. get workshopped in Connecticut. So I started doing that stuff. Interesting. And then it was after that that I started playing all the clubs and, and the pop bands mm -hmm. and everything. And it was doing shows that got me where I am now because I worked at a theater called the Good Speed Opera Company. Oh, I've never heard of that. Yeah, and it's most <clears throat> famous for, like I said, workshopping shows that go to Broadway, but Annie originated there. Oh. Uh, so did uh, uh, Shake, Rattle, and Roll, Tick, Tick, Boom, all these shows that went on to be big successes on Broadway. And uh, I was the sub drummer there. So what that means is if the regular guy can't do the gig, mm -hmm. he calls me and I come in and I do a certain amount of shows. Like from drug overdoses. Exactly. <laughs> sex rehab. Yes, like yeah. Anytime in jail. <laughs> right. Right, okay. And that was just <laughs> me. <laughs> was, um, so uh, so um, I got this call to do a production of Pippin that was gonna be there, but oh. the catch was that I had to split the show. It wasn't just come in for one or two shows. I was gonna do half of the, the run, which is about two months. Uh. And uh, at my first thought was, I really hate Pippin, because I played it <laughs> like a million times for high schools and you know community theaters, and I was like, whatever, a gig's a gig, and this is gonna be a good gig. So uh, I literally hung up the phone after accepting the gig and got a call from my cousin, who's a big Monkees fan. I'm a huge Monkees fan myself. And she said, hey, Mickey Dolenz is in Connecticut. Wow. And I was like, okay, where? And she's like, he's doing a play at the Good Speed, and I'm like, I think I just accepted the gig to play for that. And sure enough, he was King Charlemagne in that production of Pippin. Oh my gosh, wow. I didn't know that. And we took it on the road for uh, four months mm -hmm. after its run at good speed. And I was the drummer that went on the road with it. Uh, and Mickey and I just got to be good friends. We hung out after the shows. We went to see live music all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just constantly said, uh, you know, if you ever need somebody, call me. Ever need somebody, call me. Mm -hmm. But the, also the people that were involved in that production of Pippin were part of a Broadway show called Avenue Q. Mm -hmm. So when I got off the road with Pippin, they offered me a sub job at Avenue Q on Broadway, which eventually led to me manning the chair on Broadway for five months. And then that went on the road for two years. Oh, wow. So I toured with that oh, for two fun. years. And while I was on the road, Mickey kept calling me. Oh, really? Are you done with Avenue Q? Are you done with Avenue Q? <laughs> and the day I got home, he called me and said, hey, I think I have a gig for you. And then that led to me playing with Mickey Dolenz, wow. and which led to me playing the Monkees. I love and that. that too. And uh, the timing was good. So it, it was really supposed to be just a few months and then became right. two years. And that probably bought enough time for all the pieces to right. fall into place for you to get that gig. So exactly. that's pretty cool. Yeah. And plus, yeah. too, that he kept calling you. I mean, yeah. there, there, there's, you know, that fine little line, like when you call someone, you really want them really bad to do something. Like I would 
call Amy all the time and go, hey, we need to do a day drinking. <laughs> we need to do a podcast. <laughs> Let's do a podcast, Amy. And then a year went by and then COVID happened. And then, and then we're just like, you know, yeah, it takes a while for things to fall And then John Billings went on tour with the monkeys. And it's like, yeah, yes. our production it. crew. <laughs> it just takes a while for things to fall in place, but they were meant to be. Yeah, it's been that's how I look at it. That's cool. Cheers to that. Cheers okay, to that. Success, yes. Everybody. You love it. Take it. Yes. Mm. Mm. And so, um, I know that you've been, so what year was that that you joined the Monkees? Uh, I joined the Monkees in 2012. Oh, okay. Uh, I joined Mickey's band in 2010. 2010. Yeah. And so, um, for those of you that don't know, the production crew, John Billings, <laughs> also <laughs> plays with the Monkees. So these guys have known each other a long time. And that's yeah. why yes, we're we just staying at our house and I was... You know, we drove over for just for this. So. <laughs> Which I was just watching you all. I don't know, you were in Oregon? Were you in yes, Oregon? Yes, I was. Yes, and so that's where I was watching the video clip from it. You guys are like awesome. Oh, thank you. <laughs> awesome. Thank I'm you. like going, wow. I mean, I was just enjoying the little clip it. I'm like, now I want to go like actually sit in the audience and watch yeah, a show. They so, are pretty awesome. Fantastic. Yeah, it's Thank fantastic. You. And this farewell tour is a really excellent. I mean, I, I've uh, been lucky enough to already hear what about five or six shows and uh, it just keeps getting better and yeah. better. It's really, really good. And the audience looks like they're having so much fun. I mean, just because they would peer through the audience. I'm like, everybody is having a blast. Yeah. So. They were having a blast. So how did that change your life forever? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, it, you have to uh, run from women. All well, it's interesting like because I've been, you know, I've been uh, a musician since I started taking lessons, obviously. Um, but I've had, you know, there were a lot of gigs before that. So like I toured for a couple of years with a guy named Greg Piccolo, who's kind of a legend in the uh, New England music scene, him and a guy named Duke Robillard started a band called Room Full of Blues back in the 70s, and they backed everybody. Um, and then Piccolo went out on his own, and that was my first touring gig. Um, and I played all over the country, and that was cool. I played in symphonies, that was cool. I played on Broadway, that was cool. But the Monkees gig is the gig that's gotten me the most respect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I would say, I'm on Broadway, and people would be like, yeah, whatever. You know, I'm touring with Greg Piccolo. That's great. You know, <laughs> but the minute I got the Monkees gig, it was like, it's very odd because not that I would ever do this, but I could go on a gig, and just be horrible, and people would be like, "That's Rich Dart. He plays with the Monkees. Isn't he great?" <laughs> and it's a very bizarre thing to me. Um, not that I would ever do that. Mm -hmm. I don't intend to play horribly. It just happens. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, so yeah, it did change my life in that yeah. I got a lot more respect, uh, even in like the local scene in Connecticut. Well, and that's so, they're so iconic. And I think that, uh, you know, that's what I talked to um, the production crew, John, <laughs> my trophy husband, about all the time, was how it's just such a neat thing because we do have so many musicians in our circle right. mm -hmm. of people, and every one of them, when they know he plays for the monkeys, they freak out because they're just iconic. Right. I mean, they were just such a huge deal, not just musically, but just the whole culture of when all of this sort of thing was culminating in right. the 60s and, you know, and so um, it just was a different era of music that was kind of being born. And it was, you know, people, even in the music scene, get really excited. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know. So have you been, um, how long, it, when you first come to Nashville, how, when was that and how often do you come to Nashville? Um, well, I first came to Nashville years ago with Greg Piccolo. Mm -hmm. uh, I played here with him. That was early 2000s. I came here with Avenue Q. Uh, I've come mm -hmm. here with the Monkees. Um, a lot of times. A lot I, don't, of times. I don't remember how many times we've actually been here. How many times have we been here, John? So there's the Skirmer Horn, there was uh, the Ryman. The Ryman was amazing. I feel like that was it. Is that, was that hey. It? Yeah, we rehearsed, oh, you know, we rehearsed here one year, oh, too. Oh, yeah, SIR so to leave from yeah. Nashville yeah, yeah. for the 50th anniversary tour. Oh, that's right. Yeah. But another time that Rich came to Nashville, which we're going to uh, be really excited about, is he came here to record an album with that John and I are producing. So it's uh, what we call, in professional terms, in the can. In the can. <laughs> in the can. In the can. All right. <laughs> I, can't, I cannot wait to open that can. <laughs> 
<laughs> now that's going to be really cool. I, I, I remember those sessions. I that's cannot awesome. wait to open those. Those were fun. Yeah. So I always ask this question and I always want to know your perspective because this is one that is, is very unique because Nashville is growing just at a crazy rate at this mm -hmm. moment. And there's so many genres of music that's here. So I always want to see your perspective on old Nashville from say 2010 or mm -hmm. the first time he was here versus when you were here now. Oh. How do you feel that Nashville, what, what do you feel is the biggest change that you've seen so far? Uh, it's definitely more developed now than it was back then. Um, I see a huge change in the downtown area. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, I remember when I was here with Avenue Q, we were here for like two weeks. So, you know, the only time you have to worry about working is eight to 10 at night. So I had my days free and I'd go here, I'd go there, but I spent a lot of time on Lower Broad just going to hear the different bands. Mm -hmm. And it would be very casual, very loose, you know, tourists coming in and out, you know, and, mm -hmm. um, and now it's like insane how many people are down there. Yeah. And like, even during the day, like I started to walk down there the other day and I saw how many people were there and I just turned around and walked the other way. <laughs> and, and I mean, it's great for the people working there. You probably there, passed but... about 10 bachelorette parties on the way. <laughs> yeah, well that's the, the other thing. All of that stuff is new here too. Yes. So, and you know, when I first came here, it was like, this is amazing. Cause I'm, you know, I love old country music. Yes. And I love like Hank Williams <laughs> and Ernest Tubb and Loretta Lynn and all that stuff. So that was really cool when I first came to Nashville and saw all that. And now it, that kind of is going by the wayside. I don't want to be a bummer and say no, bad things. That's, no. I feel like it's more pop oriented now. Mm -hmm. And you know, country music's gone pop as well, but, um, you know, but in the same respect, I've experienced some really cool things here too. And I think that's one of the things that we love about Nashville because Amy and I grew up here too and just mm -hmm. knowing that the change that has occurred over the last few years and we want to keep old Nashville. That's important because yes, <laughs> it is very important that we do keep some aspects of old Nashville and yeah. the music. That's what makes Music City who it is, what it is. Right. And even though there's so many different people that move into Nashville and they may play country, pop, um, you know, it could be any, any genre of music, but I just want to make sure that, gosh, Nashville needs to stay Nashville. That's what we're about. Yeah. That's what, that's Preserve what everybody, that thing that everyone wanted to flock here. Absolutely. To see and Absolutely. hear. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, definitely. I mean, there's still, there's still some of that. Like I, I know mm -hmm. Robert's Western World, they have some of that. Labels, oh, I they love have Robert's. Some of that. Mm -hmm. Robert's is one of my favorite places to um, go. So, I mean, it's still there. And obviously the Ryman is still there, mm -hmm. which is a big deal. And the Ernest Tubb Record Store is still up mm -hmm. and running, which is amazing. Yeah. A lot of people don't know too when you're like at the Ryman, but if you want to go to like, say, Robert's or Tootsie's, there's a back way entrance into there. That's right, the alley. The alley that everybody in Nashville knows about, usually, or any musicians, yeah. um, that you can go upstairs and sit in the back bar. I have many times and sit with some really great people um, over the years. Um, artists that usually maybe even play through and they, they pop upstairs just to have yeah. a little cocktail and yeah. sneak out the back door yeah. so nobody even knows they're there. So That's also the alley that Hank Williams used to just drunkenly walk down. <laughs> <laughs> We're hoping that all he did was walk yeah. <laughs> down the alley. <laughs> so what is one of the, all right, so with all the places you've toured, what is your favorite place of all the places Ooh. all over the world, what is your favorite place that you've toured? That's a tough one. Or maybe a couple places. I want well, to narrow it down to one. I would say one of the biggest highlights was the Sydney Opera House. Mm. We went oh, with the Monkees yeah. to Sydney Opera House in 2019. We sold it out, I might add. Oh, um, that's so cool. That was a dream come true for me in so many ways because it's just, it's a work of art, mm -hmm. A. Yes. And B, it's just, you know, every musician dreams of being there, but, it's, you know, me being like a classically trained musician, that's like the icing on the cake, sure. you know? So. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of the, the weird things about being a classically trained musician playing in the pop and rock world is you have a different sense of what things should sound like and what the acoustics are. 
So as a classically trained musician, you want to go into a huge concert hall mm -hmm. and just like one of the things I love doing, I did it at the Skirmahorn, I did it at Sydney, I, is I just go up and I tap my snare drum ever so lightly and it just goes oh. and it's amazing. <laughs> amazing. And then I think to myself, well, that's going to sound terrible now because we're miking everything and we're going to amplify it. And sometimes that's the case. You yeah. play a, a symphony hall that's built for acoustic groups and you know, you've got these PAs that make it just loud and not as, doesn't sound as good. The Sydney Opera House, they had it down, man. Mm -hmm. They had, they carpeted the whole stage. Mm. The sound was amazing. Oh, wow. And it sounded just as good when we turned the PA on as it did when I just went out and did that. So, oh, that's yeah, so that's, that I would say, be, is the top of the list. That is a really Absolutely. Cool um, and then, uh, after a while, it all, it's, this is so cliche, but it all blends together. Mm -hmm. um, you get to the city and you're like, oh, okay, I've been here before. You walk in the door and go, oh, I've played this place before, or wow, this is new. Um, but as far as cities go, Chicago has always been a favorite city of mine. Mm -hmm. I love Chicago. Um, I'm, I'm really biased that I love New York, because mm -hmm. I grew up around New York. Um, and, uh, yeah, Seattle's pretty cool. I like Seattle. Yeah, Seattle's nice. And Nashville's <clears throat> pretty cool, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We think of course. so. Yeah. We do. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, it's definitely when, you know, you see on the list, you go to Nashville, you're like, oh, cool. <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah, those all fall on the lists. That, I don't know. That's Australia great. just sounds like... I know. I don't Australia know. was amazing. Like Part-time. Australia and New Zealand. I would take it. Yeah. yeah. One of my little checklists someday. Yeah. Get yes. it off my list. I love so. England, too. My wife and I... I have a passion for England. Good. We, we, we're thinking of retiring there. Oh, oh that's great. Of course, awesome. I'm a musician, so I can't retire. So, but, um, <laughs> Musicians <laughs> never retire. They just keep playing until they, right. God takes them home. <laughs> and honestly, I think one of the most fun trips I ever had out with you guys was during the 50th anniversary tour and the Mobley Park Festival. Oh, that yeah. Was my, that was mine in Birmingham, awesome. England. I have to tell you, that was one of the best experiences. John and I just went home and talked about that for a long time. That was great. <laughs> and we got to play on the festival with the Polyphonic Spray, oh, it, which was things. very cool. And they joined us on stage for, for the <laughs> tune, which was amazing. It was like a thousand people on stage. And all these uh, people in the, in the grass, and they were all dancing and throwing hay and yeah. drinking. <laughs> it was really cool. Yeah, and Sounds the BBC, like the BBC <laughs> covered it, and I was like, "Wow, that's a little, you know, that was a little more excitement than they normally get." <laughs> I, you know, we have a sin now in Nashville, and people will get so excited when because it's outdoors. Uh -huh. And um, they did a little pan the other night when, actually, I want to say um, Philip was there. Philip he Charles was, was he there. He played there with, and they uh, had a little pan. Alice Cooper, Cooper. yeah, and, and Ace Freely. Those people were going crazy. Uh -huh. I was like, now that is a party right there. That is yeah. a good time. So, yeah, yeah, that's right. They were having fun. Well, we're going to take this moment. We'll call it intermission. <laughs> yes. Okay. And we're going to hear about the second wine that we have during the halftime right here performance. So, Kimber, talk to us about the other wine that yes, you brought. Yes, absolutely. And then while um, you sip on your non-alcoholic drink. <laughs> Featuring seed lip aromatics. Yes. <laughs> We're going to try a new one. So We are. So um, one cool thing about um, Morgan Winery, it's uh, Santa Lucia Highlands AVA. And so you've got the, so Monterey Bay, I mean, y'all know how, if you've been to Monterey Bay, it's pretty cold in that area and it's super deep cold waters, but they have a wind that comes through that gap and it is super cold and it's um it's very windy and what happens is is that that cold air keeps in temperatures in that area about even in the summertime like mid 70s but at night times it'll drop down to like mid 50s so when the after what happens is is basically the fog rows in and you've got this almost like a nighttime blanket and so the the grapes in this area i mean they're very robust they have thick skins on them and so they develop beautifully and so they chardonnay uh sauvignon, sauvignon blanc um some of your um like Grenache, Pinot Noir, things like that can grow fantastic there. You just can't grow a lot of like cab and things like that. But this area where they're growing these is, is absolutely amazing. And so this next one that we're getting ready to try is gonna be uh, Morgan, it's called Coach de Crow. 
like crow, like just like our crows here okay. in the vineyard. So um, this is a uh, Syrah Grenache blend. It's um, aged for 10 months in barrel and 14% uh, of it is new. And the great thing about this is that, of course, the winemaker, so um, there we go. I, I poured you some there, cameraman. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. Look at that. So oh, nice. the color of this is so Cheers beautiful. Everyone. Cheers, Cheers, everybody. everybody. That Grenache and that Syrah. Oh, yeah. Ah, so you get that pretty, like, ripe strawberry. You want to stick your nose in there and smell the pretty ripe Whoa. strawberries? Like, <laughs> I think I just got drunk from sniffing it. <laughs> it's a party. So he, you know, the, the winemaker, they love, they love Cote Cerrone and they, they wanted to something, a little fun name. It had a couple different names, but they made it Cote de Crow because apparently the crows, just like we have here in Nashville, those big old crows that they walk around in, in my backyard. <laughs> 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 they, for somehow or another, they know when the grapes are ripe. So they, oh. they eat them at full brick. So oh, it's no. like, why do you leave all the other ones when these are ready to go? So they are a little bit of a pain in the rear end <laughs> uh, for, these, for the winemaker, but you know, they, they named it ac actually after, because the crows are very smart. And they know when it's ready. they know when it's ready, so they, they try to eat those. Right, so, there'll be no wine before it's done. Be no I think, time I, think I might wine. get dinged for that. There's um, somebody's little slogan. There's a slogan somewhere. <laughs> So um, one good thing about Morgan is they're um, organically farmed. They're organic certified. Um, they're SIP certified, sustainably farmed. So I, I'm really super excited about um, being able to show these wines, and I know at the bar too. Yeah, and so, this is a really nice um, one. They're beautiful, and we're super, super excited to have these in our portfolio. And these so, wines are available here? They're going to be available. They should be available yes, here. Yes, they're going to be available That's the here. fun thing. She brings me all these things a lot of times before they really hit the scene. So, um, mm. And fortunately, um, Kimber brings me things here that are not normally sold by the drink. So sometimes you'll find these in retail stores, but most unlikely to find them by the drink. So you can say that you were fans of this wine before it became big. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. You can also say we only have it at Wine Down Nashville. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> it's, it's fantastic. I mean, you have a little spice on there. You yeah, have the ripe strawberry great. notes. Um, I, I had this out just recently trying some, some retail stores on it, and they're like, oh, my gosh, that is, like, fantastic. That is a so. great wine. That one's kind of uh, one of the ones we put in the category of eat too easy to drink. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Yeah, that one does not have a bite. It's really smooth. I think you need more. I know I need more. Okay. I mean, it's I'm me. Not going. I'm like, going. I think you need a little more. Now, here's a novice or non-drinker question that you can feel free to tell me is stupid. Would you ever mix the red and white together? No. No. Why not? Why not? I mean, let's see. Let's experiment. <laughs> you could. I mean, uh, I I don't know if I ever have. I mean. I don't know what that would even remotely taste like. I don't know. I mean, like. somebody invented the French it. fry by accidentally dropping one in the fryer. Who knows? Maybe one day. I think we're on to something. <laughs> we might be on to something. You Absolutely. could do the mixed Chantelle or something. You know, there are grapes that are um, that uh, are white um, and that uh, will... Well, they're red and they actually, no, they're white and they peel off to be red, I think. Is that right? Am I saying No, the Ooh. opposite. It's they're white. They're red and they peel off to be white. See, I've had too much yeah. already. <laughs> I just threw you for a loop. We think I think totally edit that whole thing out of there. So, <laughs> so um, with this, yes, these, I've never mixed these two, or I've never mixed a white and a red together. But it would be kind of fascinating to see. Mm. I right know there's a million to... wine aficionados watching I this. Somebody bring in some What a horrible kids. person. <laughs> <laughs> we may have to go home tonight and just do like a little splash, little splash, and then go, ah. Oh, and then we'll get like, like our hate mail. And then we'll. <laughs> Don't then have we'll that guy on ever again. <laughs> he wants to mix red and white. What a horrible person. Oh my gosh. Well, these wines are fantastic and um, they're you know they're great yeah, for bars really they're nice. great for restaurants they're great for retail stores um, and so you know a lot of times people will come here they'll have it to to listen to music and and just enjoy them and and have a, you know just something nice to eat 
or they can take them home, you know, they'll go to the retail store and pick some up and take them home and enjoy them with, the, you know, something they have at home. But these are fantastic. I mean, if I was going to a bar or restaurant, I would certainly ask for yeah, these. Yeah, I love this. So. This is a nice line. I have not heard. And where is this from again? Um, this Monterey? is Monterey. Uh -huh. from Monterey, So the California. Santa Lucia Highlands at AVA and, um, yes, they, they have a whole line of, their Pinot Noir um, actually has gotten a 90 point plus rating on every vintage. Wow, that's great. That is so, really great. There you go. Yeah. They should Fantastic. try a little harder than it could be a <laughs> But, you know, that's not a bad grade. It is. Yeah. Everybody gets a trophy. Everybody, everybody gets a trophy. <laughs> that's a good one to have. Oh, my so, gosh. Anyway, so. Uh, I want to use this time also, while we're having our wine, to um, point out that one thing I love hanging about Rich is it's like he's a walking library of, like, stuff that I never knew. And I don't even know, like, in a lot of categories, like music, TV. Yes. <laughs> and last night. Night, I was talking to him about Nashville and how we have um, a winery here in Nashville and I teased Tyler the founder of uh, Love and Exile Wines I, I was teasing him that the Nashville wines taste so good that he makes because all the juice is shipped in from somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> and his tanks, though, in Nashville, they're crazy. They're huge. Yeah. When you go there, you're like, oh, yeah. my gosh, these tanks are ginormous yes. that are here. And it's downtown Nashville. And it's in downtown crazy. Nashville. And they're really good. And I was talking to Tyler, and he said he's from Canada and that he had investors um, that were uh, Canadian hockey players. And so we're talking about this over dinner, to which Rich said... Well, it sounds <laughs> like if you get these hockey players together and, you know, support their wine, you could have an event with a band that plays nothing but hockey songs. What? <laughs> I thought he was just kidding me. You thought I was joking. But it just so happens... I'm in a band that plays nothing but songs about hockey <laughs> called the Zambonis. <laughs> what? Yes. I'm sorry. Yeah. What? So the Zambonis, they've been around longer than I've been in the band, obviously. I just joined about two years ago. Uh, they started about 30 years ago. Okay. It's the brainchild of, of this guy, Dave Schneider and Tarkin Kiedis. And uh, Tarkin Kiedis is one half of the Kiedis brothers. Uh, his brother Peter's kind of famous. He's a Grammy Award winning producer. He's He's uh, made the sound for uh, uh, bands, a lot of bands, um, that I can't think of any of their names right now. And we are the ones that are But drinking. anyway, um, I can see one of the band's yeah. videos. They had like a puppet dancing around. Do you know what I'm talking about? No. Mm -hmm. ah. Anyway. Google it. But uh, he's actually uh, working with uh, Taylor Swift right now. But anyway, oh um, But anyway, so they formed this band, the Zambonis, as, you know, a serious band, but, you know, goofy. And all their songs are about hockey. <laughs> that is interesting. And they actually had, like, a hit with this song called The Hockey Monkey, the which hockey became monkey. a theme song to a Nickelodeon show. Oh, my God. Oh! Oh! Okay, do you know keep what I'm going. talking yep, about keep now? Keep going. Yep, I do. I don't know the name of the show. I'm trying to think of the name of the show. It's, um... Oh my gosh. But it goes, all the scientists all right. are running yeah. around Google. looking Google. for the monkey, but he can't be found because he's down oh, on the geez. ice playing hockey with the monkey. Oh. And then they go, one, two, three, kids got the Come monkey. Come on, Amy, now. you know this. Four, my five, kids are six. Grown. The monkey's <laughs> got a hockey about stick. You, I mean, this is, oh, you know this. Um, look. Our camera crews. He's trying to find So it. right here, insert the Jeopardy theme song. Do, 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 There's lots of Zamboni do, do, do. stuff on here. But they've, they've, they've done a lot of other songs, and since I've been in the band, we've written a couple songs together. Uh, the latest one is called The Gretzky Twist. That is oh my hilarious. Which we, we just released a little while ago. And uh, During the pandemic, Chris Franz from The Talking Heads, who's a good friend of, of the bands and a huge fan of the bands, uh, put this little lockdown festival together where he filmed a bunch of bands and they showed it at the, the library and you could stream it online. And we chose to film ours at a hockey rink on the ice. That's great. And it was available just for the people who, who did that, but we just released it on YouTube and you can actually go and watch it on YouTube. Oh my it's called God, The Zambonis Live mm. on the Ice. So if anybody wants to book a, a hockey band. Hockey band, mm -hmm. Zambonis. You know. See, they wouldn't want somebody like Give me, me because I know guy. what I would do, <laughs> I remember back in the day, before the Nashville Predators, they were called the Nashville Knights. Do y'all remember, do you remember the Nashville Knights? I don't. The hockey? And 
It was the national. <laughs> it was the national night <laughs> before that, and yeah, I used to scream at the uh, referees to keep their day job because they would <laughs> wow. just not. They would just make terrible calls, <laughs> and so yeah, I was one of those crazy fans that would stand up and tell the the referees to keep their day jobs, and so yeah. Well, I was surprised <laughs> that they called me to join the band because I know nothing about hockey, <laughs> like nothing. The only thing I know about hockey is my dad used to get tickets to the New Haven Nighthawks, which was a minor league team. And uh, we'd go like every once in a while, and there was a player named Nichols. And one time there was a woman in the stands who was rather well endowed <laughs> and not having the support that one would normally need for that. And any time Nichols would score a goal, she'd stand up and go, Nichols! Nichols! So that's all I knew about hockey. <laughs> Was the slingshot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, and, and the movie Slapshot. That's the, Slapshot. Those are the only two things that I, I knew about Slapshot. hockey. Slapshot. I think that movie was called the Slapshot. The Slapshot. The Slapshot. Nichols. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. But now I'm in a band that sings all songs about hockey. That, that, well, I guess that's, that's, you know, how you learn about hockey. <laughs> you join a band that plays hockey. Right. Yes. Yes. I, you, you know what I'm going to be doing when I leave here tonight. <laughs> You're going to be Googling I, I, I'm going to go home monkey. tonight, and I'm going to start Googling. <laughs> <laughs> well, the best part is, out of all that hockey monkey stuff, we have a mascot who, like, will go to our gigs and play with us. He's in that oh on the God, ice video, and it's a guy dressed up in a monkey like? suit. Oh, monkey suit. He's oh, the hockey right. monkey. The hockey monkey. The hockey monkey. Well, there oh you go. My gosh. Like, how do you get to be a hockey monkey? Well, you know, if your podcast tanks, you know? <laughs> you know, you guys should have the hockey <laughs> monkey on here. We should. We do. We need to have the hockey <laughs> monkey. You can't let him drink, though. Yeah, no, that would be hard. I mean, have to do it through a straw. <laughs> <laughs> Poke a little hole in the yeah. center and stick a straw through. Yeah, here, be still. <laughs> We'd have to pump it. <laughs> <laughs> That's where your box wines come in. Yeah, your box wines. There you go. You getting any? Right, exactly. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, that was fun. So tell me, well, at least, well, before we wrap up, give us one um, random fact that about Rich Dart. That no one knows mm. except maybe his wife. I don't know. Maybe his wife. Hi, Jay. Camera crew. Hello. Uh, oh, maybe camera the camera crew. crew. Oh, that's yeah. Right. yeah. One random fact about yeah. me that no one knows. Uh huh. All right. This uh -huh. is a story that's going to make me look really bad. <laughs> oh. Okay. Do so, we need more? <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> like, do we need more? So more? listen to this. <laughs> when so I already told you I was a big monkeys fan as a kid. And in high school, the monkeys, uh, it was the 80s, so the monkeys had their big resurgence in the mid-80s. And there was a girl named Nick. Oh, I shouldn't say her name. Can we edit that out? Yeah. <laughs> uh, there rhyme, was a there's a girl, and her name rhymed with <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So anyway, um, so I was in high school, and there was yeah. this girl who wanted to date me um, mm. and take me to her prom. Mm. And she had told me that her brother had the original monkey's talking hand puppet, oh. which is worth a lot. And it was still oh. in the original box. <laughs> and uh, incidentally, this is why it makes me look really bad. <laughs> her brother had committed suicide like a few years earlier. Oh. And this is why I'm such a jerk. I said, I'll go to the prom with you if you give me the monkey's hand puppet in the box. Oh, no. Oh, my gosh. So, Winning yeah. points with all the fans. So I ended up going to the prom. <laughs> Did you, get, did you get the puppet? I did. Ah, oh, cheers. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, now everyone's going to hate me. Okay, my question is, where is the puppet? <laughs> this makes See? me look even worse. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, going down, I'm going down the rabbit hole right now. More <laughs> wine, anyone? Anyone? <laughs> anyone? More <laughs> wine? Do you anyone? need some wine? <laughs> I might have to start drinking. Um, there's this little website called eBay. <laughs> what? Oh, no. Okay, and on that note, yes? let's... Uh, no, I don't know. Well, I also want to say, when I come out to the monkey shows, I have so much fun watching you, and of course my trophy husband. <laughs> but um, you guys interact really well, and I love watching you. And I also love watching you sing every word of every song. <laughs> it makes it way more entertaining, because I can tell that you're not actually just playing it, but you're enjoying it. 
Oh, thank you. You know, and that emotes, and I really love that. And both you guys have that. And I, I mean, he doesn't sing every word of every song. He just stands around and looks like, you know, flaming, flaming hot. <laughs> That's you why I have to mouth the words because I can't look as hot as him. So now, so. next time he's playing, I'm going to send you a, a little uh, a little clip with a flaming hot emoji above yes. his head. Yes, we might throw one above yours. Send it to your wife. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there you go. Yeah. So yeah, there we go. Yes, and Tracy, his wife, and I always talk about you know no fits the rest of the band, but we we think these guys are the hottest. So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in saying that, so what's going to go on? You know, tell me about like how this is going to play out the end of the tour and what is going to happen because this, they are calling this the farewell tour and mm -hmm. it probably is so november 14th the last show so yep. how what do you think how's this all going to play out here in um well uh, you know since people have announced well, since they announced that it's the farewell tour you get all these people saying oh yeah right right the, you know every band says that but this isn't like kiss in 1985. right right this is this is the last tour um they're in their 70s. You know, they've, they've done this a long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mickey's still gonna go on and do yep. solo shows. He's, he said he still wants to perform. Um, I've got the Zambonis. I've already got uh, symphony gigs lined up. Uh, I have another band of kids I, I grew up with. Kids, we're all in our 50s now. <laughs> but um, uh, called Cream Corn. And uh -huh. we record and, and play. In fact, that band, is not really a band as much as it is just a group of friends hanging out. Yeah. So like when you know you and your friends hang out and drink wine, we'll call each other up and say, hey, let's book a gig. We want to get together and hang out. That's great. And that's what we do. And we're actually in the middle of the year of the corn, which <laughs> is really interesting corn. because uh, there's a project yeah. that I came up with a few years ago for myself where we write and record one song a month oh. and then release it on the internet. Um, we had to get creative this year because I was going to be gone for a few months. So we actually recorded some basic tracks while I was home. And then um, I actually mixed them all together. They send me their parts and I mix them together on my computer. That's great. With a lot of help from John Billings, who knows how to do that <laughs> stuff, and I don't. Um, uh, so we've released songs every month of this year so far, and we've got a few months left. So I've got that going on. Um, uh, I play on a little island off the coast of Rhode Island in the summer called Block Island uh, with an amazing band called the uh, Young Guns and I'm there every Sunday in the summer which is wonderful and uh, whoever calls me I'm gonna go play with because that's, that's what so I do. Great. That's so great. Maybe I can I mean, call you to play. Yes. <laughs> come on, I'll come down. Come yeah. play with me. <laughs> I think that's so wonderful. I mean it's almost it, and we have cul-de-sac parties in our in our cul-de-sac. We we used to have a lot, but we had a lot of artists that lived in there, and they would they would all just come out, would sit in a fire pit, have some cocktails. Some of them didn't drink, but some did, and we would just sit there, and we'd sit there all night long and yeah. just listen to music and still well, they'd tell stories about life on the road, and but just it was so much fun i, I really enjoyed it. one particular person um scott van zinn if you're listening <laughs> out there i think you're in las vegas right now um it's just so much fun because i miss having him there and he would play and um you know just our kids growing up it was always so much fun just to get a group of people together listen to music just have some community time some fellowship and just fun yeah. and yeah. that's what it's about it's yeah. about, you know just spending time together and yeah. enjoy each other so yeah that's what's also a little bit neat, you know for me to watch as an outsider watching what's going on with the monkeys tours because there's also this whole subculture of people who have followed them their entire lives yes who have become friends from following the monkeys yeah. yes and so that's always neat to see all of these people that are really dedicated and loyal fans because it you know just brings up their childhood memories and it carries it does. them and it keeps them alive it does so, right you know that's a real unique uh, experience that i've gotten to watch from the outside and it's interesting you know it's neat that they're able to get that experience still. So I hope they'll be able to carry on uh, some of this fun stuff, even though the tour is going to end, yeah. but to have these uh, oh, experiences yes. and be able to remember them for the rest absolutely. of their lives. You know? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh -huh. And it feels the same way to me, too, because, uh -huh. I mean, the, the whole organization, uh, especially the band, have become family to me. Right. Yes. So it's right. like, it's like, this is ending. This is my right. family, you know. And, 
you know, thankfully Mickey's going to be doing solo yes. shows, but again, like that's only going to be a few more years, and you know, these people don't are just Mickey as don't tell Mickey that. Don't tell Mickey that because <laughs> really, I think he's, he's going to work forever. I think he's going to work forever. <laughs> but yeah, I do. But it's it's been a confident. it's a family to me. So yeah. you know, in fact, I called people in the band more during the lockdown than I did my own family. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully they won't be listening. But anyway. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> they never look at anything I do. Right. <laughs> I have to ask a question before we like wrap all this up is that I want to know what is the craziest adventure? Oh, look, he's already laughing. <laughs> oh, no. Don't let it come out your nose. Don't let it come out your nose. The craziest adventure. Um, let me, okay, this is a two-part question. Craziest venture that you've ever had, and also, uh, what is the wildest fan that you all ever had? Oh no! I mean, there it has to be. Uh, no, there has to be some fun. How much time stuff. do you have? Well, I, well we, we can sit here all day and talk if we yeah, need to. It's called day drinking anyway. We got wow. two bottles of wine, so. Hmm. Uh, well, I do love to tell stories. I have a lot of them. <laughs> Um, craziest adventure. Well, I'll tell you a story that I absolutely love. It's not really an adventure, <laughs> but um, it's one of my favorite stories ever. So, as a drummer, one of the things you carry around is something called a stick bag. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's literally a bag mm -hmm. that you put all your drumsticks in yeah. and you carry it around. So, I was on tour with Greg Piccolo in the early 2000s. I don't remember what year. And we were playing in uh, New Orleans at a club called Snug Harbor. And we played that night. And it was one of those things where we were traveling the next day, so Pick said, you know, we'll tear down tomorrow morning. So we came back to the club in the morning. And New Orleans, as great as it is, can be a little sketchy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the rule was, you know, this, is, this wasn't like big, huge tour bus. This was a bunch, three guys traveling in a van where we put the gear in the back. Um, so the rule was somebody had to be by the van the whole time. Right. We would take turns. So from New Orleans, we went to Houston. And while we were packing the van, there were these two kids hanging around the van. So we were extra careful. We get to Houston, we unload the van, I'm setting up, and I can't find my stick bag anywhere. And I'm like, Greg, I can't find my stick bag. And we all immediately said, those kids, those kids <laughs> took your stick bag. So we had to go to the local music store. Luckily it was open, I got a new bag. I shoved all my sticks, bought all new sticks, shoved them all in there. A year and a day, I am not making this up, a year and a day later, mm -hmm. we are back at Snug Harbor. Mm -hmm. And we're there and we're setting up and um, on the top of cymbal stands are wing nuts to hold the, yes. the cymbals down. Yes. I'm unscrewing the wing nut and it falls off and hits the stage and goes between the little crack between the stage and the wall. Mm -hmm. And I pick up the wing nut and I see my stick bag no! stuck between the stage and the wall. No! Fully loaded. Oh Nobody had gosh. even noticed it was there. Wow! And that's a testament to the cleaning crew. That's right. <laughs> well, it was. It's black, and you know, if you look back there, you can't it's, see it. Right. I mean, it was a little musty because of New Orleans, but um, oh. and it's the stick bag I use to this day. Oh I my won't gosh! Won't get rid of it. Oh. Faithful. So that's one of my favorite stories. <laughs> that's fantastic. That's a fantastic story. That is pretty good. Oh my goodness. So, I like yeah, that. I call it my lucky stick bag. That is your lucky stick bag. Oh. But, um, but year to the day and you a actually. A year and a day. And if you hadn't have, if that hadn't have flipped off and, and hit, it, mm -hmm. you would have never seen that. Right. So it was supposed to, that was supposed to have happened. <laughs> so there you go. So there you go. And so any crazy fans oh, that y'all had over the years? Oh my gosh. I'm sh oh, I can't, Do I we can't go imagine. <laughs> First off, all our fans are wonderful. They're <laughs> no, they're great. Really no, quiet. no. There might be a lot of editing. The editing of no, this. No, all our fans are great because let's face it, if there's nobody to come see us play, right? There's no reason to play. Absolutely. You know, we all love playing music. But, but you always have that one in the crowd. There's one, well, is there not? There's always at least one person in the crowd that's just off just off the charts. I mean, they are. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But that's not a bad thing. No. <laughs> anybody ever rush the stage? Um, I don't think we've ever had anybody jump on the stage or anything like that. We've had people rush the stage, but, you know, nothing terrible. Um, Our crack security team would have stopped. That's right, yeah. <laughs> um, we've never had any, any 
any incidents like that. That's or good. Fans. I mean, we've had fans that have somehow worked their way backstage, and they're usually the ones that we know really well. And mm -hmm. we're like, what are you doing back here? <laughs> oh, and then we have to escort them out. But it's, it's pretty cool. Um, I know why John's smiling because he knows what I'm story I want to tell. Story. No, I signed an NDA. I'm not doing that. <laughs> there was one fan who uh, we were playing in BB uh, Kings in New York with Nikki, and she has since come to several other shows. And at the end of the show, she came up to the stage and asked me for my autograph, which I always think it's ridiculous. But um, she said, "Can I have your autograph?" And I said, "Sure." What do you want me to sign? And she proceeded to present a portion of her body. <laughs> Which I'm, I'm sure that that happens quite often to a lot of different yeah, artists. Yeah, but it had never know? happened to me. <laughs> and I said, okay. And she handed me a ballpoint pen. Oh, that would hurt. And that's, and that's, that's exactly, that. and I said, I'm oh, not using it. that pen. She goes, why not? I'm like, because that's oh, going to hurt. Wow, she didn't really think that through too no. much. <laughs> so I said, if you find a Sharpie, I'll do it. And sure enough, she did. <laughs> and I was able to write my full name, middle name, the junior at the end. No, I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> but yeah, she has since reappeared <laughs> uh, several great. times. But yeah. Huge fan. Well, I'm huge. just like, Huge listen, fan. Because you... <laughs> <laughs> and more eyes than one. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I think that's a good note to leave this yeah, on yeah. tonight. Well, now that I've kept you abreast of everything. Okay. <laughs> I've been waiting for something. I've been, right. wait. I've been right. waiting all night for you to do something yeah. like that. So yeah. there we go. There we I go. mean, I guess that's the perk of the uh, of the, being a musician. That's right. <laughs> Unless you play in the, the uh, what's this big one? The... Xylophone, the, marimba, the, the big one. The marimba, the, the marimba, big one. The big xylophone. It can be a, a, a titillating experience. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. Well, Rich, thank you so yes. much. You're hilarious. I love you to death. Oh. oh, my gosh. This has been so fun. And please catch the rest of the Monkeys Tour. If you haven't gotten your ticket, you will not be disappointed. Yeah. And uh, you're going to have so much fun watching these guys, too. Uh, Kimber, before we wrap it up, would you please go over the two wines that yes. we are showcasing from this fabulous maker one last time, so in case our audience is wants Absolutely. to go and find us. We will, we will. Um, of course, again, this is Morgan, their unoaked Chardonnay, which is fantastic for all you people out there who do not like a oaky Chardonnay. This is for you. Um, and then the Coach de Rhone, which is a fantastic red blend that you can, oh my gosh, there's so many foods I'm sitting here thinking this would pair with. Um, this is fantastic. Price point's great, and you just cannot go wrong with this. But Morgan, Morgan Wines, fantastic. They have so many. Um, they have a double L, double, um, it's double, uh, basically, uh, they found out they were having twins right at the very end, so they, that's why they call it double L Vineyard. I'm so. telling you, double oh, yeah. L, twins, all of this is like tying into yeah, the theme of yeah, our yeah, show. Yeah. <laughs> it's their, it was their double luck, so that's the reason why they named it double L for their, so double luck. Oh, so okay. anyways, but these wines are fantastic. We love them. And a Cote de Crow, right? Cote de Crow. Cote de Crow. Absolutely. Okay. Look, yeah. it even says it on here. So. You can even pan in and actually see it right there. So, <laughs> and by pan in, we mean look at that. Yeah. It's in 3D now. <laughs> but these wines are great, and um, so I'm I'm so excited that you were here tonight to do this. Oh, I'm so you. excited to meet well, you. This is fantastic. Yes. So, well, cheers to the music scene, yes. to you, and to day drinking Nashville. Absolutely. Everyone. Cheers, everybody. What the hell? The that was awesome. Don't move. That's how we do it.